وكلا نقص عليك من أنباء الرسل ما نثبت به فؤادك وجاءك في هذه الحق وموعظة وذكرى للمؤمنين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه المعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, we are starting uh, again with our durus on the Prophet wasalam, and we have reached a new Prophet and that is the Prophet Hud salam, who was sent to the people of Ad. So after Nuh salam, after the demise of Nuh salam, he had children who had children and later on came these people their actual lineage i'll give you inshallah next week or some other week but these people they were uh, there's two qums there's two types of people here one is that allah created from his immediate progeny in the fourth or fifth generation of nuh salam he created the people of ad and another one is that he created the people of Thamud. Both of them, Allah gave them a lot of power. He gave them wealth. He gave them might. He gave them strength. And he, get, he made them giants. He made them giants. And they lived in the Arabian uh, lands. So as for the one that we're going to do today, and start off today, because it will go on for you know, a few weeks, inshallah. And both of them will go on for a few weeks. But as for the one that we're doing today, of Qawm Ad, the people of Ad, they were based in Ahqaf, a place called Ahqaf. Ahqaf is a place between uh, Yemen and Oman. Yemen and Oman, this is what the historians have said. That's where Ahqaf is. The word Ahqaf has appeared in the Quran. In Surah Ahqaf, the, the Surah itself is Surah Ahqaf, Surah number 46, Ayah number 21, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَذْكُرْ أَخَا عَاد. Remember uh, Ad's brother, um, Hud alayhi salam. Remember him, إِذْ أَنذَرَ قَوْمَهُ بِالْأَحْقَافِ When he warned his people at a place called Ahqaf. Now, what's... Amazing about this is that why Allah is mentioning, mentioning these stories in the Quran and why they're going to stay till the day of judgment is because they were within the same place where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. Uh, so Yemen is not very far from uh, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started. So one's in the south of where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was and this is the one that we're doing. And the other one, Thamud, is in the north where... Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He even passed by them, but by their uh, territories, uh, when when off to uh, in the battle of um, uh, Tabuk, or when when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went in, in the latter part of his life. We'll cover this inshallah later on. But he told his companions to quickly pass by, uh, because these are the ruins um, of those people. Now the one that that is in the south, which we're covering now, which is uh, between. Yemen, Oman, this place, Ahqaf. The other significance is that this place is in a place where the Arabs would, would retreat. So they had two retreats. They had one retreat in the summer. When it got too hot, they traveled towards the south. And this was the place they would try and travel. And this was part of the trade route. And the other one was when it came to the winter time. Uh, they would want some more warmth, so they would travel slightly up north and they would go to Sham or Syria. And that's where the second, you know, the Thamud was based. And saying this, it was directly to the, to the people around the Prophet Sallallahu time to understand what Allah had done to these people and what they had said. And the fact that the people coming after them have said similar things. Now, what is really important here is for us to understand, some people have brought up and they've said, you know, these old stories in the Quran, we should replace them with other stories. You know, there are people across the world who've said that. Um, 
what is really important is, from, the, from Allah's perspective, is that none of these people have changed. So the things, the accusations they're making, the types of accusations they're making, are the same accusations that have been made from the old time, from Nuh Salam's time till today. And until the Day of Judgment, the same things will be said. So you know, some people, they get hyped up. Why is it that um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why is it that they're saying all these horrible things about him? Well, this is what they did to Sayyidina Nuh. And they did, you'll find out in, to, to Ad, you know, the, the people of Ad did to um, uh, so Sayyidina Hud, the people of Ad did to Sayyidina Hud. And Sayyidina Salih, again, he faced the same thing. And every Prophet that came, they faced one, you know, they, they faced a community of people who ridiculed them and who said things about them on their face. The, the thing that we need to learn from this is, not only there is an established pattern, there's an established pattern between the people of Batil. The people of Batil are the people of falsehood, there's an established pattern. And they will behave in a certain way when truth comes to them. And you will see in all the stories that we're covering, you will see this pattern emerging. But what's also important is, there's an established pattern for the people of truth. So if we regard ourselves to be the people of Haq and the tr on truth, we've got to also understand that we've got to follow the seer of the Anbiya, we've got to follow the ways of the Prophets. Which is that when you're ridiculed, you've got to have a way to respond to that. You can't put ridicule to ridicule, you can't put mockery to mockery. Somebody says something bad to you because you went and gave da'wah to them, then you say, what, what do you know, you this, you that, whatever, you know. You can't do that because then you're not following the established pattern that Allah has given for the people of the truth. And that wouldn't be right. So <clears throat> these people, Allah had blessed them and they were people not only mighty and they had a lot of strength, but they built many different monuments. And they, they, were, they were builders uh, and they were masons, if you want to put it that way. And those people who have, you know, craftsmen or those people who know how to make nice buildings, they become popular by others. Now you've got to understand the psychology behind this. Whenever you get a people who are needed by others, the more of a need that is created, the greater they become in the sight of people. So for example, if you need a tailor to stitch you clothing, that is, you know, a need that is, that is created and everyone's got certain needs in the society. So you will go to the tailor whenever you need, you know, clothes stitched. Now that is a common need. There'll be many tailors out there. Just like if you need someone to, you know, give, give you a pair of shoes, sell you a pair of shoes. There are so, sh you know, shoe shops all around, you know, the town. So you can go to so many. There is a need, but it's a, a common need. When that need becomes greater because not so many people are available doing that job, these people naturally get credit in the society and they get a, they, they get a status. People credit them and they give them a high status. So for example, now having doctors or dentists and others, because they're so few, their demand is higher. But above that, you've got specialists. So you've got brain specialists, you've got heart specialists, and their demand is going to be on a high level and their need and necessity is on a high level. Then you will have like one extreme specialist in one part of the brain or one part of the heart and his need and necessity will go even higher. So the point here is that when you've got builders, they are one type, you know, builders, they all build fine. But these were not common builders. There were people who built on high places and they built buildings that were very strong, they were very beautiful, they were, they were admirable, admirable. Now, when, when a builder gets to that level, that they can create buildings that others find admiring, then their popularity has gone way beyond the average builder. And that is something that Allah Azza wa Jal points to when He says in the Qur'an, He says um, that this is in Surah Ash-Shu'ara, ayah number 128 to 135. Um, this is Sayyidina 
uh, Hud السلام, telling them and saying, Atabnuna bi kulli ri'in ayatan ta'bathun. What on every single high place you're going to build a monument that you take as a means of entertainment or showing people what you can actually do, you're showing off your skills. Uh, and not only were they building monuments, but they were building f great places that, that had, uh, uh, that were almost like a fortress. They were like a fortress. And these fortresses gave security to those who would reside within them. So not only were they building, you know, making buildings where others were looking at them and admiring them, but they were providing security. Now your popularity has gone even you know, way higher. Now why am I saying this is because when you become popular for one gift of Allah that is given to you or to me, the more popular you become and the more needed you are by people, the more of a natural arrogance you have within yourself. It's natural. It's natural. Popularity will bring arrogance. And this is one analyzation we do with the story of Sayyidina, you know, um, Huda alayhi salatu salam. Um, and it's not just to do with strength and power and might. It's to do with anything. They say that if you are a person of knowledge, if you know, if you know a lot of things, and you become, obviously you become popular, naturally you've got to be very careful of kibr, like Iblis, the story of Adam alayhi salam, and Iblis that we did. He had knowledge. He, he knew a lot of things, and that's why he became arrogant. Um, in this story, it's not about knowledge, it's about the might and power. Um, so, for example, in our world, what it would mean is that uh, people who become popular for, you know, I'll give you a common one, you may, you may laugh at this, but people who actually go to gyms and they really, you know, build themselves up, yeah? They love to pose. One of the things they love to do is they pose, you know, they'll tense their muscles and pose like this and pose like that and pose like that, you know. And um, they want to show their, 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 you know, biceps, their backpacks, their this, that, I don't know, whatever else it is. They love to do that. And within that, they've got to be very careful that they don't fall into pride and arrogance, which naturally it might have now pride and arrogance is the difference. Pride is when you yourself, pride in Arabic is ujub. So pride is when you yourself feel proud about your own self. Arrogance is when you feel so proud uh, and so high that you start to belittle others and you start to deny the truth or you start to ignore the truth, belittle others and it's to do with you and others. When that gets to that, that's istikbar. That is now arrogance. These people, they had arrogance. It got to that level. Pride is something, you know, natural pride. When you're just proud of yourself, like in a good way. So for example, I'm proud that I, you know, got A star in my exams. That, that pride, now that, that's a happiness. That's fine. You, you're not, you know, you're not trying to feel that you're, you know, you're better than others in any way. Uh, but the wrong type of pride is when you're doing it and you kind of have this kind of sense of self-pride where it's like, you know, I'm so good, you know, I'm so, I'm so great. And, you know, all, almost in the head, without them saying it or bringing it to their mind, it's almost like, you know, so many people haven't got what I've got. Right? That's, that's the kind of wrong type of pride. The right type of pride is what Suleiman would have done, which is to then you know, have so many ni'mas of, of Allah and then to say, Allah is testing me whether I should show gratitude to Allah or not. And I'm, you know, I'm saying, Alhamdulillah. Wa qala Alhamdulillah alladhi faddalana ala kathir. You know, they said, both him and his father, they said, Alhamdulillah, praise to Allah that he has given us so many bounties and he's given us preference over others, that's the right type of you know, pride where you feel good about yourself but you, you're saying that Allah is the one that's given to us. So anyway, coming back to these people and what, the, the point that I'm making is that any gift that we've, get, we've, we've received from Allah and the more gifts that we receive from Allah and the more popular we, we become because of the need and necessity, the more of a position it makes us easily to, to be a, a, a victim of having um, arrogance inside us and the next thing after that is 
that a person then starts to manipulate others, right? Groups are formed, right, of these type of people. So you've got to understand how sociology develops. Uh, you might have, for example, you know, in this masjid here, you're going to have a certain category of people who will always mingle with one another. There'll be a regular, you know, people who come to your salah, regular five days and so on. They mingle with one another. They say salam, they say wa alaikum salam, and they're always, you know, being in, in each other's companies. There'll be another set of people who will mingle with one another and get to know one another because of their profession, the professions that they have. And, and, but there will be another one that will, that will mingle with one another because of their status. Now here, you go to a different level. Professions, backgrounds, cultures, these are the reasons why people you know, will, will interact with one another. Friendship, you know, same job, same uh, place, same neighborhood, people will mingle with one another. But there's one particular thing which I want to mention and it comes, it's more or less around these people that we're discussing is when you have a status in the society, a class, a certain class that you get to, you then mingle on those classes. So you've got, you know, right now in, in England, you've got like a, a middle class, you've got a working class, you've got the working class and then you've got the middle class and then you've got the, you know, the upper class. We're talking about getting to a high status. If you get to that high status, then there's a different type of mentality that you create. Uh, what has happened is, for example, even in politics around right now, the people who have ended up in parliament, the people who end up in power, they have to have certain given qualities, right? So, for example, they have to be educated. You can't just end up uneducated in those places. Fine. You have to have a certain type of you know, education um, and these people w w would have gone through that. But then you would have had to go through a, you know, through, through and live with a certain group of people to get to these positions and go work through the system. So you work through your local borough and then slowly, slowly you become an MP. But once you get into that, into becoming an MP, you've got a certain mentality that overrides the pattern of thinking within the people, within the, within the parliament. Uh, and you can almost see the, them as a board of people. The same happens in any civilization and it happened with these, this community of people. With Sayyiduna Hud and you'll see the same I discussed in Sayyidina Nuh salam, and you'll see the same that I, I will discuss with other prophets is Allah called them Mala, Mala, Mala Ummin Qawmi. Now Mala Ummin Qawmi is a group of people who are the hierarchy of, of the society, who are like the, the councillors, who are like the, 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 the council, the, the shura, the council, the board, the committee, uh, they are important people or the people who make rules and regulations uh, you know, concerning that community or the people who are regarded by others to be you know, high order thinking people. This is the mala. This is the, the mala that Allah talks about. And they are people, they were the people of Ad who had not only the power and the prestige and the, the pride and the arrogance and building all of these monuments, but they were regarded out of all the giants they were regarded as the, the most supreme of the giants, right? Their thinking capacity was way beyond the average giant that was amongst them. And in our societies, in our crowds, we have the same thing. Now, having mentioned that, what you've got to understand is that no sooner does Sayyidina Hud salam give dawah, these people, they influence the mind of the rest of the people around them. They influence the qawm, they influence the whole tribe, they influence all the different tribes that are around. And what you've got to understand is the same thing is happening today, brothers and sisters. No sooner does, do we say something, but there's a hierarchy, a mala in the media that is you know, quick to snap out on us. No sooner do we say this, there's a mala somewhere in the parliament that will snap. There's a mala somewhere in some local government that they will snap on. Because these are you know, people who've got high you know in, intuitive thinking and they are not your common people so what you then uh, see is this is the pattern natural pattern that settles in that people get needed wanted they get promoted they get higher and higher until they sit on top of others and these are the people that will influence now most of those people unfortunately have denied the prophet's messages 
This is a given fact. And this is from the Quran I'm telling you. Most of those people unfortunately have denied. Some of them have believed, but their arrogance, their pride and so on, and their status and all that around, and, and the people around them and the company that they live in, uh, does not allow them to, you know, it's very difficult for them to accept the truth. So in Surah Al-Ahqaf, Allah Azza wa Jalla, He mentions, He says, this is ayah number 21 in Surah number 46, He says, وَذْكُرْ أَخَا عَادُ Remember your brother, remember the brother of, of Qawm Ad. Remember Hud alayhi salam, who is the brother of the people of Ad. Now, interestingly, He says, Akh, which is brother. It's, it's uh, the same thing that Allah said, we say the Nuh alayhi salam, Akh, why? Because though they are kuffar, now this is a very important point I'm going to mention here. You know, they are kuffar, they are disbelievers. They are people not believing in the message of Sayyidina Hud. But Allah says, Akha'ad, their brother. Allah said in the Holy Quran about Nuh alayhi salam, Akhuhum, he was their brother. Akhuhum, about the qawm. Uh, and it's very clear, and he used that about Thamud as well. And he said, Salih was Akhuhum, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ صَالِحٌ When their brother Salih said, أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Don't you have fear of Allah? Don't you, you know, have the, the internal mechanism of, of, of being aware of Allah? Saying Akh to a prophet, talking to a people who are not believing in his message. What we learn from here is, that we've got to treat them, the disbelievers, as people whom we care for, not whom we disregard. There shouldn't be a feeling of filth and disgust and a filth of, you know, and, and a feeling of looking at them as almost like, you know, who cares about you? No. There's got to be a relationship in order for us to invite them to this. Now let me give you an example. Um, if you were to do anything out there, with anyone out there, if you didn't have your good feelings about them, why should they even, you know, we're talking about humanitarian grounds, why should they even listen to you? Anything, let's just say anything whatsoever. So for example, you go, on, you go out there and you're just trying to ask a person for you know signs to where you should go or the map or you know just give, give you directions now if that person doesn't have humanitarian love for other human beings why should he even give you any concern why should he even like look at you and say okay i'm going to spend you know 30 seconds of my time trying to explain to you how to how you get to this place that humanitarian love that every Allah has endowed this to all human beings that we've got humanitarian love those who are deprived of this Muslims or non-Muslims they are deprived of a very great khair and goodness deprived of very great you know khair and goodness and it's very sad to see that some Muslims have been affected by this we're not saying that look just because they're kuffar I know there are kuffar out there and they are you know, our, some of them are enemies and some of them are trying to make mockery out of us all the time. Some of them are even trying to kill us and so on and so forth. But what you've got to remember in the beginning of the story and when Allah opens it in certain places of the Quran, He says their brother, the brother of Ad, which is Hud alayhi salam. Akhuhum Hudun, their brother Hud, who said to them these words, Allah tattaqun. When Allah says that, He's trying to say that when you approach them, You've got to have that feeling that I am sympathetic, just as I would want my own brother to be saved from the fire, I would want these people also to be saved from the fire. All right? So that feeling should be there. And without that feeling, my, my brothers and sisters, there is no real da'wah. There is no real invitation because those humanitarian grounds have gone. Now Allah reminds us that He came to the peop to place of Ahqaf. And then He says, وَقَدْ خَلَتِ النُّذُرُ Many warners had had preceded him. Min bayni yadayhi wa min khalfihi came after him and also came before him. Allah ta'abudu illa Allah. They said this message: Do not serve any other. Do not worship any other except for Allah. Inni akhafu alaykum adab yawm alazim. I fear a, a great a, 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 a great day of punishment. Um, I fear that. 
For you people, I want you to take heed and to listen to me right now and to listen to my message and accept it. When Allah says this part, Allah ta'abudu illallah, inni akhafu alaykum there's two things here. One is that he's telling them a negation and then he's given affirmation. He's telling them to stop whatever else they're doing and he's giving them direction. In da'wah, you can't do the one only. If you just negate and negate and negate, it becomes negative da'wah. You've got to affirm as well and you've got to talk about Allah Azza wa Jalla, the good things in da'wah and the good things people will get in terms of receiving what they should, should receive. The other thing here is that he talks about Qiyamah straight away, Day of Judgment, and he warns them. Um, da'wah is effective with the remembrance of Allah in there and the remembrance of the afterlife. So even if you're going to tell a druggie or someone who's on the wrong path, one of your friends, whoever it is, or somebody who you'd like to make, you know, keep as a friend, who's on the wrong path, Allah has told us from this ayah, and many, many ayahs, this is not the only ayah, there's so many ayahs that are similar. At-tadkir billah, to try and remind people with the remembrance of Allah, and at-tadkir bil yawmin akhir, to remember, remind people through the Day of Judgment, is something that is very effective and even effective today. These people continued um, in their way, and when he said to them to, to only uh, worship Allah, they said um, to him in response, and this, this is not the mala, this is not the council, this is not the people. This is, this is in Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 66 to 68. Those people, the, the council, the higher body, the, the, the body of people who are in the hierarchy, from his people, they, those who denied from amongst them, they said, Inna lanaraka fi safaha. We see you in some form of foolishness. Safaha. They called him a fool. And safaha can also be seen as stupidity. Meaning that how can you even make this common? How can you even suggest this thing? And they said that you, we regard you to be a liar, to be one of the liars. Now, when they said this to him, they called him foolish, a fool, and they also said that he's a liar. In, and this is real mockery in the face of a prophet. His response was, Ya qawm, O my people, laysa bi safaha. I am not a foolish man. I'm not a foolish man. وَلَكِنِّي رَسُولٌ مِّن رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ I am a messenger from, from the Lord of the worlds. Now, subhanAllah, look, look at the, what we learn from this. If he had said, I am not a foolish person because a foolish person does this and foolish, don't call me foolish, and he kept on going on about that, it gives them a platform to carry on calling him foolish, stupid, whatever else they wanted to add to that. It gives them a platform to do that because you've entertained their line of thinking. He said, I am not foolish, but straight away he affirmed something about himself. He said, Rasulullah min Rabbil Alameen, I am a messenger. What needs to be said to a lot of people who are saying a lot of swears out there about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the internet and other things, and they will carry on and they will increase. And may Allah Azza wa guide them to the truth. What we should say is, the, instead of saying the Prophet wasn't this, and the Prophet wasn't that, and entertain the debate. Instead of entertaining the debate, it is better to establish what he was. To say he was such a wonderful man. He was, he was Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. You know, to, to write these things on the internet, to say these things to the media. He was this, to affirm what he was. This is what Sayyiduna Hud is doing. He's affirming what he is, not continue with the debate. There's a, there's a book um, called um, Don't Think of the Pink Elephant. What did I say? Don't think of the pink elephant. What's in your mind right now? Go on, what's in your mind right now? A pink elephant, isn't it? You didn't have a grey elephant in your mind, did you? 
When you say don't think of a pink elephant, you've already thought of a pink elephant. You imagined an elephant is pink. It might be wrong to imagine it, but you did imagine it. Right? If I say, if I entertain the debate and I say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasn't a child molester, wasn't a pedophile, wasn't this. Now once I say that, you will think, na'udhu billah, people who are non-Muslims will think of him as that. It's natural, just like the pink elephant. You're not supposed to think of the pink elephant. So why did you think of the pink elephant? You know, people will naturally do that. So what you're supposed to do is entertain the debate in the right way. You take control over the debate. And this is what Sayyidina Hud is, is, is teaching us in Dawah, which is affirm what is the truth. So you tell them what they should be thinking about. Rasulun min Rabbil Alameen. I am a messenger from the one who has provided everyone and has provided you as well. So the one who provides you has sent me to you. So you know, the whole scenario now has changed in what he's trying to get them to think about. And then he, then he carries on. Uballighukum risalati Rabbi. I'm here trying to deliver messages from my Lord. وَأَنَا لَكُمْ نَاصِحٌ أَمِينٌ And I am for you a very sincere person and I'm a trustworthy person. SubhanAllah. Look how many things he affirmed. He started off by saying لَيْسَ بِسَفَاهَا That's the only part he said that he wasn't a foolish person. So that's only one part of it. But straight after that he said, look how many things. He said, Rasul, he's a messenger. He said, the fact that he's doing, uh, who's delivering a message, Ubalikum Risalati. He's affirmed that he's come from the Rabb, who is Allah Azawajal. He's affirmed that he is Nasir, he's very sincere, and he's affirmed that he is also trustworthy. Five things inside him. Now, I've already um, said to you Nasir. You know, when we, when we covered Sayyidina Nuh, السلام, I told you that it's very important to be sincere to the people that you give da'wah. So I'm not going to cover that again. But there's another sifa and there's another quality that this Prophet adds on, uh, alayhi salatu wasalam, adds on to what he's saying. He's saying ameen, which is trustworthy. If you or me cannot be trusted by a people, then it is detrimental to the message that we're giving to them. More than anything else. You know, like if we were people who couldn't speak to them, imagine that. I didn't have the way to articulate myself to all these people to give them da'wah. That is not as bad as not being trusted. If I cannot be trusted, then that is, that is a great obstacle in them accepting something from me. Now trust itself has many layers. Trust itself has many layers. When Sayyiduna Hud alayhi salam is giving them da'wah, he has had a previous life with them, a long life with them, where he's built that trust. He's not talking to an alien people. He's not just suddenly gone into a different city and said, hey guys, you know, uh, my name is Hud, by the way, and I would just like to tell you that I'm a messenger, uh, and I'd like you to understand that you should be following these ways. No, he's talking to the same people who he has lived with all his life. And Allah has done this with every single messenger that came on the earth. That they gave da'wah to the very people who lived with them. Why? And this is one of the miracles of, of, being, of them being a prophet. If you want to know signs of who's a prophet, this is one of the miracles of the prophet. Is that if me and you, imagine me or you, any person here who's listened to this. If you could turn around to your people... Uh, you know, to your own family members, your neighborhood, the people who you lived with all your life. If you could turn around to them and say that I, I have never, you know, done anything wrong. You know, I've never done anything wrong. You would not be able to say that because by natural, by, by nature, by human nature, you would have done something wrong because you're not a prophet. You would have made some kind of mistake. You would have lied somewhere in your life. You would have got caught in some kind of muddle, muddled yourself up somewhere. It will have happened. With prophets, it never happens. To prove that point, he made them live amongst their own people. Because if they suddenly lived elsewhere and they came somewhere else, it wouldn't have the same effect. He made, like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 40 years live amongst his people before he became a prophet. And with every prophet, he made them grow up and they seen the qualities and they had so much trust in them. You know, it went to the highest level of trust. So if I sort of meet you right now, you might see my face, you might like, you know, think, okay, he looks like a trustworthy person. 
and then you carry on. But then over time, when we deal with one another, one, one after another, when our dealings carry on, then the trust builds up. When you get to the highest level of trust, you've got a power over the people you talk to. Because what Sayyidina Hud is trying to say here is, almost, he's trying to say that you said I'm a liar, and I'm the most trusted amongst you. How can a liar be the most trusted? I mean, they were not, they, they wanted to say that you're just lying now to us because you've told us to worship only Allah alone, because they were, you know, they were idol worshippers. But they saw their flaw within their own argument. How can he be so trusted yet be a liar at the same time? And they knew what they were saying was just made up to try and make others divert away from him. He then carries on. This is in Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 69. He says, Awa ajibtum. Are you surprised? And ja'akum dhikrum mir rabbikum ala rajulim minkum. Are you surprised that, are you, are you sort of, you know, bewildered with the fact that a man amongst yourself has received this message, this reminder from your Lord and is now coming to you to tell you the message. Now here's the flip side. The flip side of you staying with the same people is they're going to treat you as a normal person. You stayed all your life with them. Fine, you're trusted, fine. But the flip side to that is, hey, are you, we knew who you all your life. We saw you grow up. Who are you? You're just the same as us. What are you trying to say now you're someone great? When did you suddenly you know, go to the skies and come back down with a message? We didn't see you disappear. How did you suddenly become a prophet? Now this is the flip side. And this happened, this happened to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This happened to Sayyidina uh, who and many other prophets as well and they had to then say uh, say this natural thing which is are you really surprised that this is the case why did he say that and what do we learn from that what you've got to learn is from this and this is natural human psychology natural way the brain works is that whatever you get accustomed to for a long time Breaking away from that becomes the thing that you will detest. No, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, people don't do that. Like, for example, all your lives you've seen, you've seen, um, you know, people. You've seen, you've seen um, men uh, all of all of a sudden. You've seen men all your lives in a certain way, which is what? Which is you see them maybe with a beard, or they they, they might shave the beard and so on. But when you see the abnormal when you see a woman and some women have this they might have a little bit of a mustache now straight away you're gonna laugh and you're gonna say oh, woman with a mustache well yes you know she's she you know, there are certain women that, that might have that there are certain men unfortunately they look very feminine you know they look very feminine with their, sometimes the way they dress or the way they might have their hair, the way, the way they might act and the way they might behave, you know. Can you imagine a man who's got long hair and he's like, he's always going, and he's, you know, there are certain men who do that. Now, you're laughing because it's the abnormal, it's not the normal thing that you're accustomed to. And anyone who's not accustomed to anything that's normal, you know, when the norm breaks, People find it strange. It's like, what? What is this? How can it be? You know, what are they talking about? Until it becomes a norm. Now, there's a, there's a great danger to this. The danger is when a sin becomes norm, a norm, you've got to really fight against the whole thing. Like, you know, I, I was just discussing with, um, I know, in inshallah, some separate time we'll cover this, but it's kind of becoming normal for certain men you know, out there to try and have feelings for their same gender. It's, it's becoming normal for certain men. And the more time is going on and the more people are making this a common thing, the more people are coming out and saying that, oh, I was born like this. I have always felt like this. You know, I've always had my attraction to other men. You know, and the thing is, the thing is, you know, let's, let's just, you know, one, one imam said, he said, look, if you develop an attraction for your neighbor's wife or even your brother's wife, if you just naturally felt an attraction towards that, are you just going to say, oh, Allah created me with this? 
I better go to my neighbor's house and just like, you know, like express my feelings and say how I feel. You gonna do that? Are you gonna say to your brother, you know, brother, I'm sorry to say, but you know, you just got a lovely wife there who's like, who's, who's creating a lot of feelings in my head and I'm, I just can't help myself. I think, brother, you better step out of the way because I've got, you know, feelings too. Are you gonna do that? You're not gonna do that. Just because you had feelings and they were there naturally inside you doesn't mean that it's a license from God to try and go out there and do what you want. You know, what is happening here? Just because a man feels the same thing about, uh, and you know, a certain man feels that about uh, other men and just because a certain woman might feel that about other women doesn't mean that you just go out there and do what you want. These are things that may occur now and again, but you've got to, you know, you've got to do something to control, you know, yourself. So the, the lesson that we're learning from here is Sayyidina Hud is saying that what, just because it's not normal to you people, just because it's not normal to see a person amongst yourself now warning a message, you know, delivering a message of warning to yourselves, are you just going to reject this message on those grounds? Now, what he does is Sayyidina Hud uses a third tactic, and this, all messengers use three things. All messengers used three things, three things to try and remind. And these, these are the three principles of da'wah. One is that you give da'wah by reminding people about Allah. Another one is that you give da'wah by reminding people about the Day of Judgment. And the third one is you remind people through the gifts that Allah has given them. These are three major parts of da'wah and major roots of da'wah to, to get people to think um, along you know, the, the, the message of, of haq and truth. So. He said, Wadkuru, remember, Idjalakum Khulafa, when Allah made you people, the vicegerents and the people who took over others before them. Mimbadi qawmi Nuh, after the, the people of Nuh alayhi salam. Allah gave you a reign on the earth. You are ruling the earth right now. Now, for us, what do we learn from this? We learn, subhanAllah, you know. All of us, Allah has given a status in our lives. Some way or another. Some way Allah has made you with given you some control on this earth. Whatever control Allah has given, whether it's in your own house, with your own family, whether it's at the workplace, whether it's in your so social sort of setting, whatever Allah has given you a, a, a sort of dominant, dominance over others, you have to see that as Allah giving you that. There's no way me and you would be able to have this without Allah giving it to us. So he said, remember that gift, what Allah has given you. Then he said, وَزَادَكُمْ فِي الْخَلْقِ بَسْطَةً Allah has increased a great amount within, the, within your progenies. You know, as having children and being able to have children, subhanAllah, what a, what a great gift. When you meet a man, you know, I, I just met um, a great individual when I, when I traveled to India. I met a great individual who has got so much money, so much wealth, and he's not stuck for money and so on and wealth and so on. But out of, you know, a good 30 years of marriage or 35 years marriage, Allah only gave him one son. That's it. That's that one son is going to carry on wherever he's got. And even then, you think about it, if that one son was to, you know, if Allah was to take him, then he's got nothing left. He's got no progeny left. Now it's only Allah's blessing if some of us have received, you know, brothers and sisters in the family, some of us have got our own children, you know, every single child is a, is a gift of Allah and, and however we increase, that increases from Allah as well. So he's reminding them with that. فَذْكُرُوا آلَىٰ اللَّهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So he says, remember the gifts of Allah, the many bounties Allah has given so that you may be successful. Remembering sitting down, and, and I want to just, just say this before we um, uh, carry on. You know, a lot of people, they, they, um, they feel sometimes distant from God. They feel distant from Allah. One of the ways of feeling close to Allah is just to sit down and just think about the gifts of Allah. That's it. So you spend 5-10 minutes or you spend 15-20 minutes, however you can, just sit down in peace, in silence, in your own quiet time and just remember, okay, Allah gave me this and Allah's given me this. And Allah gave me health, and Allah gave me some wealth, 
and Allah is giving me a status and Allah is giving me a job and Allah is giving me family and Allah is giving me a house and Allah is giving me the, eye to, the eyes to see and Allah is giving me nice ears to listen. I haven't had a problem with my hearing. I haven't had a problem with my seeing. I haven't had a problem with talking. I don't have a problem with my neck and I don't have a problem. Go through every element you can think of. I can move my hands so easily. I can walk so swiftly. I can run when I want. I don't have a problem with you know, my, my um, sleeping, you know, I don't have a problem with my eating, I don't have a problem with this and that. And then Allah has given me food on the table every time when I've needed it, Allah has given me drink whenever I've needed it, Allah has made me, you know, have happy, many happy moments in my life and Allah has given me X and Y and Z and you start to go and even when you think about sort of food or the place you live in, to go into each one and Allah gave me to eat from all these varieties and Allah gave me to live uh, in such comfort and think about the comfort itself. When you start listing and detailing and going through that in your mind, uh, there's a different, the, the mind itself, subhanAllah al-Azim, will start breaking up. Your heart will break up to Allah. You'll feel a closeness to Allah that you haven't felt before. And I'm telling you this, please try this. When you do it again and again, you start to see, subhanAllah, you know, what are, you know, you feel, what has, what has Allah done for me? What, how much has Allah given me? And Allah did, and then you think, you say to yourself, did Allah have to give me all of that? Did He really have to make me be born or be in this country when I could have been, you know, in a different country somewhere else? I mean, I, I just traveled to India and I, I um, you know, we got, you, you only, you only see certain gifts of Allah when you see the opposite. Unless you don't see the opposite, you won't see the gift. So, you know, in this country, you know, right now it's the cold started, right? The winds have started again, temperatures dropped, right? And this is normal England. Nine months, we're going to live now with this until the next summer. And then we're going to just look forward to a few days of the sun. And we're going to say, Ya Allah, please, you know, give us a nice summer again, right? You're going to crave for that because normally in, in, in England, clouds gray clouds and you know rain and the forecast today is going to drizzle the forecast today is going to light showers the forecast today is going to be this heavy rain the forecast today is going to go forecast rain rain cloud cloud rain rain and you live in this all the time and you think you know oh, i wish i was in the mediterranean wish i was in this country wish i was there right and it plays on your mind sometimes went to india and um when i i just went there for about 10 days it was only 32 degrees, only 32. Now, 32 degrees in England is like a fantastic day. It's like you have a hot, hot night summer day, but you know the difference is, 32 degrees here would be with wind, with a bit, bit of a breeze, a bit of air. The humidity and so on would not be you know, so high. Uh, but 32 degrees in India, I felt like I was in an oven. It was, the air was so hot. It was just so hot, so sweaty, so, you know, it was almost like you can't breathe. You're, you've got hot air all around you all the time. Now, when I stayed there for a few days, and then after five days, Suddenly Allah gave rains. He sent the clouds in India and the rains came. Wow, Allahu Akbar. And we're in the Atikaf and it's hot and you're trying to fast as well all day and then you're doing Tarawih in the night time as well. Allah still makes it easy, Allahu Akbar. You know, it was easy to make the fast. I have to say that. Allah made it easy and that's one thing. Allah makes it easy to do His Ibadah. But after five days when the rains came, Allahu Akbar, you should have seen the smiles on people's faces. You know, the temperature dropped slightly, became a bit cooler. And I said to myself, I said, man, the ni'mah we've got in England, I will never think again twice about that ni'mah. Right? These nine months that we're having, subhanAllah, it's nice and cool, guys. You know, you can work, you can think, you know. You just put the heater in your house, you're fine. If you're in heat, you've got, even when you put AC on, there's a problem because it gets your throat after a little while. You know, it gives you headache. The heat gives you headache. The heat makes you not be able to work, right? I sat on the train next to some Indian person, um, and straight away when I sat, we start, we start, you know, having a conversation. And he said, you know, where are you from? And I said, I'm from England. And he said, he said, wow, you know, he said, 
you know, you, you're so lucky. And I, I thought, what is he trying to say? He said, you're so lucky. He said, you don't have to get up every day and you don't have to think about your day. And I'm thinking, what is this guy trying to say? This man on the train next to me travels about, I think, 150 kilometers in 150 kilometers out of Delhi every, every weekend on just to learn a language which he's going to learn to try and find a job which that job will try and get him a bit more extra money which is looking forward to move to a western country now when you sit next to him and he's telling you his whole pain his agony what he's going through and what he's doing and how hard his life is you sit there and you think subhanallah how easy Allah has made life for us. Now what I want to say to you is with this ayah that I've, that I've just um, talked about and him saying فَذْكُرُوا أَلَىٰ اللَّهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Think about the many gifts of Allah, what Allah has given you so that you may be successful, you may succeed. You know one of the ways of us trying to get ourselves close to Allah is just to realize and go and see opposites. You know if you want to know the ni'mah of uh, your eyes, simple. You know, either go and visit a blind institute somewhere or act blind for a few minutes in your house. You can do this. You can basically, you're in your house, just close your eyes, right? And just touch your, feel your way around the house. Yeah, just make sure you don't fall down the stairs. Right? And then come back to me and say, you know, Sheikh, I've got this, you know, this broken leg because of you, yeah? So make sure you don't do anything, you know, or near knives or whatever, you know, you, you do. So, you can do that. You can, you can act, you can act, you know, helpless. You know, on, you, you, know you just can get a, get a chair or something and act as if you might, you know, may Allah forbid this, but people who are in wheelchairs, you can act or, or even just go and visit people who are sick and, and see the gift that Allah has given you and, you know, not given them and praise Allah for it. And there are hundreds of things that you can, you know, you, the moment you go out there, you can see a lot of people. And the biggest gift, Allahu Akbar, is just look at the people who don't have Iman. And yes, we want them to have Iman, but that itself is such a great gift. You know, when you think about all these gifts, it makes you come close to Allah Azza wa And then it makes you stay away from sin, stay away from the thought of this dunya, this world. Sayyidina Nuh is trying to get them uh, to think about this. What we will do, inshallah, we'll carry on with, with uh, this um, from Surah Ash-Shu'ara and many other verses that have been uh, mentioned uh, with this and analyzing this story. Um, inshallah, we'll carry this on next week. Jazakumullah khair wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. ذكر علم ونور الحاملات سنة ونور والرسمات هنا سرور يا حلوات الكاسنين